Sanjana Swarup is a corporate lawyer turned social entrepreneur. She is dedicated to building an SDG positive and circular business and community in India. She is currently building Eco Dhaga, a disruptor in the fashion space, changing the way India consumes and disposes of fashion. Before I get started, I'd just like to give an introduction uh, about Eco Dhaga and how we came to be. Eco Dhaga, Dhaga means threads in, in, in Hindi and it literally translates to conscious threads and that's what we're trying to build awareness around the fashion industry. Uh, because as Nina already pointed out, there are several reasons to be alarmed and concerned about the fashion industry in general. Uh, in India particularly, it, like the fact that we are one of the world's largest textile manufacturers, largest importers of textile waste uh, from the global north, uh, as well as the fact that we are one of the largest consumer markets that complicates things in terms of textile waste so far for us. Uh, so it was very essential to bring about uh, consciousness about the way the fashion industry is working and how it impacts India, because India is also vulnerable to climate impact. Um, I, I believe it's important for us to frame businesses in the sense of, uh, you know, the climate and environmental impact that we're having because we are facing repercussions. This has been, I don't know what's the weather like where all of you are, but this has been the hottest summer experienced um, around the world. Uh, and that's saying something being in India. I just want to take an overview and talk about industry innovation and infrastructure in general and how uh, we need to reframe and change the way those have been built as well. Um, and a simple definition of industry uh, has been, you know, processing of raw material to turn it into a product in a factory. Uh, but we never like in the 18th century that became uh, synonymous with mass production when industrial revolution came into being and uh, we wanted products we wanted to sell them we wanted to sell them repeatedly to the same customers and then uh, the whole innovation in the industry came about of how to make it cheaper better and faster uh, which is probably good for businesses as Nina also mentioned it's a capitalist world uh, but it is not good for the environment so far, we have seen that from the industrial era, like from 18th century till now, uh, this is how the carbon, uh, di uh, like carbon dioxide um, rate in the atmosphere has also increased and changed. And uh, this change, while year to year, it may seem very small and insignificant over a span of the last two centuries, we can see that the impact has been great. And uh, we are changing the global temperature. We hear about these terms, global warming, climate change, but really don't connect it with, you know, like how it's affecting us individually or as business owners or as business people. But just last year, emissions were recorded at 2,390 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere. And just to give you a frame of reference, one gigaton is one billion tons. Now, I was never good at maths. I don't even want to try to attempt to count how many zeros um, in that billion tons there are. Fashion is the second largest carbon emitter in the world. This is also a fact, but uh, all of us, again, I feel like there is a difference between being aware and then taking action. Uh, so while all of us know we have heard about this, that fashion is the largest carbon emitter, uh, there are enough clothes like... Uh, and this is something I will talk about later on as well, that what does it mean to be innovative in the space of fashion? Uh, but uh, yeah, fashion industry, the way it is going on, um, it cannot continue if we are also to keep in mind our climate goals and if we are to achieve them. There is this culture where we are being you know, bombarded with advertisements. And uh, a decade ago, there was not an industry called marketing tech or ad tech, which is a thriving industry today. Uh, and what they are selling is actually consumer data of how we shop, how we behave. Uh, but that has become something that has enabled brands and businesses to also bombard us with so many ads and offers and uh, tell us to buy, 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 because, uh, you know, FOMO, you will miss out on the trend, you will miss out on this opportunity, limited styles. Uh, that has led to overproduction on part of the organizations like businesses, especially in fashion, overconsumption on our end as well. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I've grown up in a middle class family in India, and I remember 
when I was in my early teens, uh, we would only buy clothes on occasion. Either uh, it was a festival, so one of the major Indian festivals is Diwali, when we would buy clothes, or it was a birthday, um, and that's it. We would buy probably clothes two or three times in a year, and uh, that's it. But now it's like, I'm having a bad day, and let me feel good about myself, because this is instant gratification, so let me just get something online. Um, I'm, you know, there's a sale, so... Uh, Amazon and Flipkart in India, they have these big billion dollar sales days and everyone's just like, okay, um, I'm practically saving money by getting, you know, 10 items instead of two. So let me just do that. Uh, so we have come into this mentality of over consumption as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I I'm sure this is a common problem across the globe. At least I had that when I was living in different places, um, was that we have limited uh, closet space uh, but we are continuing to buy more and more. Um, and then we want to get rid of, you know, what, okay, I, I probably would never wear this. Or I probably, it looked better in the store than it does now. Or the occasion that I bought this for has come and gone and I haven't gotten to use it. So, um, yeah, we just get rid of it in the most convenient way possible for us. Um, now, I don't know how many of you have seen Wally, -E, but this is one of my greatest fears that that's what we're moving towards. Um, because if you really analyze the term landfill as well, um, it's supposed to be dug out and you're supposed to fill the land up. What we are seeing now as mountains on landfill is not um, the intention with which landfilling was brought up as a solution to the waste management problem globally. Um, and now what we're seeing is not neither sustainable nor safe. Um, there have been cases where these have uh, combusted simultaneously as well because of the methane emissions in the landfills and because of lack of segregation of textiles and other waste uh, as well. Uh, one thing I would like to mention here is that um, as... Um, Morris had pointed out during our introduction that 51% uh, of the textiles that end up in landfills are post-consumer. Um, we figured that 80% of them are reusable, recyclable, or salvageable in some form or way, but only 1% was currently being recycled. Um, so I believe Nina has already covered this. I just wanted to put this in the context of sustainable development goals as well. Uh, what we don't see about the fashion industry. Um, fashion industry is infamous for not paying living wages, uh, getting... So this is something I often ask my consumers and my uh, cohort members as well, that uh, when you're buying something for very cheap, uh, someone is paying the cost for it. If it's not you, it's someone else through forced labor um, or through, um, you know, exploitation. But uh, someone is paying for that. There is no way you are able to get a product that cheap. And this is an experiment I will encourage all of you to also go ahead and do at home is try to grow a tomato plant or any plant in your own garden and see how long it takes to give fruit. Uh, and then decide how much are you going to value uh, your time, effort, and energy into growing that one plant uh, versus what the cotton producers or uh, fi fiber producers might be getting in terms of, uh, you know, payment uh, for making the garments. So, for example, in India, uh, if I compare, um, you get T-shirts starting from 99 rupees. And uh, just to give some uh, like context, one rupee is about uh, 100 rupees is about one uh, pound uh, approximately. Uh, and so for one pound, you're getting a T-shirt, right? Um, and then it goes to question that how much is the cotton uh, grower, the agricultural producer is getting for that uh, T-shirt? which is actually close to negligible. So uh, it's not really living wages. Now, there are a lot of uh, global campaigns going on about who made your clothes. I encourage you guys to look into it. Who made your clothes or, uh, you know, uh, pay the wages because certain big name brands have not paid wages during COVID uh, to their manufacturers as well. Uh, one of the other things that also um, the fashion industry is great at uh, doing is allocating where parts of productions need to take place. Uh, so where labor is cheaper or affordable or regulations around labor are a little lax so they can get away with a 
few things, right? Um, one of the famous incidents was the Ranka Plaza fire in 2013, uh, which was in a factory, uh, well, you can call it a sweatshop, in fact, uh, where almost 300 workers passed away as well in the fire because they were not able to get out of the building. And that happened because there were no fire hazard safety schemes put into place in that uh, in that building when, uh, which was, I think, uh, Zara was the uh, business that ran that particular sweatshop. Um, so they are able to exploit cheaper labor. Again, these feed into gender inequality, poverty, and lack of decent work and economic growth for certain sections in developing nations. Um, the next part of uh, fashion industry, I think uh, Nina also touched upon that. Uh, we oftentimes, while we like, you know, colorful things and shimmery things and okay, sequins. Uh, but we often fail to acknowledge or uh, really figure the cost, the environmental cost of producing those garments. Um, so your chemical le leaches into the water system and the soil system. Uh, soil system, it degrades the pH, turning arable land into arid land, uh, which is problematic considering that because of climate changes already, we are seeing a reduction in um, like the land available for crop production, for food, and food insecurity has also become a thing in Global South. Um, but uh, yeah, so arable land is turned into arid land because of chemical leaching into the soil, and plus the chemical that leaches all the way into our ocean systems is really affecting the oceanic biodiversity as well. Uh, not to talk about the microplastic pollution, uh, but that is also significant because every time you wash a garment made out of polyester, which is what we like to hide our plastic term as in fashion, we call it polyester fabric, or now we have poly blends, which are more popular like rayon and viscose, and all of these have varying degrees of polyester in them. Uh, but when it leaches into the oceanic system, it also affects the biodiversity um, of the oceans. Currently, we are in the sixth mass uh, extinction of species, and uh, fashion is a big, big contributor in that terms as well. Um, in terms of uh, sustainable city and responsible consumption and production, we are already uh, seeing how, um, you know, with the landfilling problem, that that's not the case. And um, I believe we as uh, consumers, as business owners uh, and stakeholders in the ecosystem also have a part in this. So um, I'll quickly move to the next uh, slide and this is a question that uh, I feel like all of us have grappled with that is is it possible to attain you know this Goldilocks zone where everyone is happy with industry economy and climate like uh, are all thriving um, this is something I will try to answer but I will also pose this as a question to all the attendees here because uh, I, I think no one has been able to justifiably answer this question yet. Uh, when we talk about innovation, especially in the climate space, and I'm not, not just talking about the fashion industry, I'm zooming out a little. Uh, when we talk about innovation in the uh, climate space, uh, there are solutions that have been brought forward as, you know, magical, it's like those magic beanstalks that Jack had, that, okay, this, this will sort out everything. Uh, one of the biggest solutions that is being offered to the climate crisis is the carbon capture technology. Um, even when investors uh, invest in the space, in the climate space or the sustainability space, they are more interested in the tech avenues uh, without really considering uh, what that means. So uh, when we rely or when we give ourselves the sense of uh, um, sense of peace or ease that, okay, we have a carbon capture system in place that will capture all the carbon in the atmosphere that we're currently producing. I think it lulls us into a false sense of security that we can continue industry and production at the rate and pace at which we are like producing right now. Um, but no one really brings up, can innovation also mean decarbonization or taking steps back um, and does decarbonization and degrowth mean, um, you know, that the economy would collapse? So here I would like to give an example. Um, when I was growing up in India, we had these Kirana stores um, and it literally translates to like a corner store, a convenience store. Uh, where everything was kept in like big jars. Instead of buying it in plastics and packets, um, things would be in big uh, glass jars. So you can see biscuits and 
cookies and snacks that you wanted to buy. You would weigh it out according to your household and use, um, including grains, lentils, everything was laid out in big sacks and you could again uh, take according to use, measure it out and uh, take it home. And then came in in the 80s and 90s, this big push towards using plastic in India was also brought about. Uh, where people um, convinced us that plastic is more hygienic and it is the safer way to consume. Uh, so, uh, like, when we are talking about innovation, can it also mean decarbonization in some way? Can it also mean going back to what was practiced? Because solutions exist. Models uh, exist where things were not this dire. Um, but we have shifted away from those in the name of economic growth or scalability this is another term that is uh, thrown a lot especially in the um, startup industry or the uh, you know like manufacturing segment that scale can you scale this idea uh, so here i would encourage us to uh, also disrupt the way we perceive businesses and is there a way to reach distribution without uh, really changing um, the way we are using plastics or without changing how it's getting to the consumers, but changing the way we are using uh, modules for distribution. Um, here, I think uh, Nina touched upon circular economy. And for those who don't know what it is, this is what something it looks like um, in terms of uh, what linear economy is. And uh, while there is a shift in the global industrial uh, space um, and people are getting more aware about um, sustainability in general and like panels like this, we are discussing sustainability. Uh, we are heading towards a recycling economy where we have convinced ourselves that, um, you know, um, if not linear, at least we are recycling it. So I'm consuming. I'm going to continue consuming as I am. But as long as I recycle things, it should be fine. Um, Recycling also, uh, we need to understand and highlight where recycling is not a full solution. Uh, so talking about textile recycling in India, because we are one of the largest importers of textile waste with this promise idea that we are going to recycle them. Um, in India, when we conducted our research at Eco Dhaga, uh, most of the textiles which were being recycled uh, were actually being sent to cement factories to be used as uh, fuel for their high calorific values. They were burnt in kilns, in cement kilns, uh, to continue production. Um, and so then the question is, is it, it's out of our sight, but is it out of our environment? So what kind of recycling practices are also needed to be put into place to make this model work is something that we would encourage uh, all of us as business owners or consumers here to actually think about. Uh, now, I've mentioned a couple of things on the slide, which I would encourage you to also look into. Uh, one is Earth Overshoot Day, which tells us how much resource we are using and uh, that we need to reduce our reliance on using these resources if we are to live on this planet for the next seven generations. Um, circular economy is what we are trying to implement at Ecodhaga as well, and I'll briefly take you through our model. Uh, when we first started acquainting ourselves with the fashion waste problem in India, we really broke down the fashion waste problem into four segments. Uh, process waste is everything from crop to uh, fabric. Uh, Post-production is everything from fabric to garment. Post-retail is what happens in, um, you know, what happens when the garments that you have put in stores don't get sold. Um, and then post-consumer uh, is where we are focusing. So we only focus on post-consumer waste because while India imports a lot of post-consumer waste as well, uh, there is no channel of disposal for the post-consumer that is being generated in India itself. So that is where we thought we would focus on. Uh, just to give a little uh, brief about, there are some uh, good businesses that are working in different spaces in the various waste segments. Uh, but as a majority uh, post retail waste, especially for higher end brands, and this is something you can go back and look into as well. Uh, some brands like Louis Vuitton and Burberry actually burn their inventory, uh, which is not sold because they do not want it to be sold at a cheaper cost or be associated at a certain price point or a customer that is not their target audience. So here, this is how we are closing the loop. And uh, this is how we are working with consumers to, you know, like make sure that 
post product post consumer waste has a way to go so we thrift we rent we mend we buy sell we do this thing called kapda project which is donating to vulnerable communities we also declutter with consumers uh, so that they have a responsible way of decluttering we upcycle we recycle and we also do awareness workshops and events um one of the reasons of how uh, if i may just give a brief of how this came to be uh, is because uh, when we actually started with an experiment we were the first in india uh, to start collecting post textile uh, post consumer textiles with the assumption that it's only going to be upcycled or recycled but we got brand new items with tags intact and uh, we thought it would be a wasteful venture uh, to kind of cut up a good resource so instead we decided to thrift it now out of the garments that we get for thrifting about 30% uh, have been discarded by consumers because of a broken button or a broken hook or a broken chain um and uh, this goes to just tell us about our convenience consumption behavior so much that it's easier for us to order a sub like an alternative or a substitute immediately rather than getting it fixed and repaired so that is also something we are trying to work on that you know getting things repaired uh, in a timely manner so that they can be brought back into the economy in a meaningful way the word swachhata means hygienic or cleanliness in india and uh, the government of india is on a mission to kind of ensure that we can make a clean india again because um, of the waste problem and the waste segment in india generally is quite informal and unregulated so there are waste pockets in india which are not properly managed uh, we are trying to change that with the swachh bharat mission which is to make india clean uh, and including with all the stakeholders so this is what we are we have set out to do at eco dhaga uh, that is make the indian fashion space zero waste uh, elongating the life spans of textiles by uh, doing everything possible to make sure that they don't end up in the landfills and leading the slow fashion revolution in india by a means to go so uh, we've already been privileged enough to be uh, recognized at a lot of different places and we believe we have a long way to go with conscious consumers and community members like you i believe we can get there um and yeah these are some of the awards that we have already received but again um uh, there's a lot more to do and a lot more to uh, show people that the circular model really works and there is a need to shift when we're talking about innovation let's also talk about de-innovation and decarbonization and get there uh, so i would encourage all of you to embrace zero waste fashion with uh, eco styles and eco dhaga and you can follow eco dhaga on our journey on all of these platforms